<laughs> well, you can choose. With my elders, I'll let you choose whether or not you want to play the game. So it's called Black Love. Which is? And it's very mm -hmm. simple. Black love is an easy game. And it's just because I want people to understand that psychologists are normal people and we can have fun. And so mm -hmm. I put on my timer and I give you 15 seconds. I'm going to give you a category of something and you have to name eight things in that category within 15 seconds. And here's the caveat. You can't say, um, uh, ah. Uh, no filler words. <laughs> That's all it is. It's very. If you simple. give me something too risque, I'm not going to answer. I, if you give it too oh, risque, no, 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 I'm no, not no, answering. It's not. It's <laughs> nothing. No, no, no. Okay. No, I wouldn't do anything like that. Come on now. Come on now. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> nothing like that at all. <laughs> all right. Okay. Let's so. Try. But well, this is a practice run, so I see people are on now. So we're playing Black Love. Dr. Cambone has graciously agreed to play. So I'm going to give her 15 seconds. You get a category. You're going to name eight things in 15 seconds. No um, uh, eyes, no fillers at all, okay? So the okay. category is, and I'm going to do a little more explanation for other people because you will already know what this means. So Dr. Cambone is initiated as an Akonfo in the Akon tradition. So we're going to go that route. And within 15 seconds, I want you to give me the names of eight in Samanfo. I mean, excuse me, eight um, Abosum or the deity. So eight different deities within 15 seconds. No, ums, us, eyes. See, I gave you all that time to think. Go. Asujibi, Asubwafo, Asu Ojefo, Tigere, Ubo Kwesi, Nane Esi, Asu Abana, Daddy Kofi. Time. You did seven. I, I should yeah. have just gone through my libation. <laughs> I would have known like at least 20. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a warm up. It really allows people to come <laughs> on. <laughs> Are you up for doing one well, more category? Now that I'm all sweaty. <laughs> I said, now that I'm all sweaty, we can get start now. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ife Tayo Ojelade. I am a licensed psychologist. I am also the executive director at A Healing Paradigm. I see people that are on today, and I know we have people that have specifically signed up to hear our um, amazing speaker today, Dr. Mawia Cambone. So do me a favor and say hello in the chat. Let us know that you're here. Share your energy with Dr. Cambone. I want to start out by just telling you a little bit about Dr. Cambone and I'll share a little antidote. Dr. Cambone is a licensed psychologist. She is also the founder and director of ONIPA Psychological and Consulting Services. She is based in North Carolina and she is also the founder of Black Therapy Central. Is it Black, it's Black Therapy Central, right? Dr. Okay, want to make sure. Black yes. Therapy Central, I will share the website with you and, to, and allow her to tell you a little bit about the work that they are doing at Black Therapy Central because I think that it is really critical. And particularly at this time, Dr. Cambone is also initiated as an Akan priest, as an Akonfo in the Akan tradition. So that's out of Ghana, West Africa. And she is here today to um, have this conversation about us working as psychologists, but then also, hi Adobe, I see you there. Um, not, a, not only working as psychologists, but in addition to working as traditional healers. And so if you were here yesterday, then you heard part of uh, the initial conversation. We were to have our elder, uh, Pat Newton was to be with us yesterday, but unfortunately she, well, no, I won't say unfortunately, 
her spirit decided to make the transition to the realm of the ancestors. So she wasn't here with us, but we did still remember her and the um, work that she has done, which was significant. So I'm really excited about Dr. Cambone being here today. So welcome, Dr. Cambone. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Coach Pat Newton as a friend. And I was so honored to be able to share this platform with her. And so I know she's still with us because this work is so important to her. And give thanks to you for considering us together on this platform. Now, I'm really excited, and this is my anecdotal piece, is because one of the things that was really significant about Dr. Newton to me is I met her one time when she came to Atlanta, and I happened to get to go out to dinner with her and a group of other people, and I didn't rem think she would remember me, but she has such a, she had such a um, big spirit and a warm heart and just a welcoming heart, and she was always willing to mentor and just pull younger mental health professionals along. And so she remembered me and she uh, reached out to me. So when I reached out to her to talk to her about doing this, she was more than willing to do it and spent a long time on the phone, just really talking to me and talking to me about her experiences. And it was really impactful. And so, I mean, she really will definitely be a giant in the field of mental health for people of African ancestry, and she's going to be missed. The other connection, which is an anecdotal connection that I have with you that we discovered this summer is that we were talking. And when I was growing up, my grandfather would tell me about the town that he came from in North Carolina. It was a teeny tiny black town that does not exist anymore. And I never, ever met anybody else <laughs> that knew about the town. They look at me crazy when I said the name of the town. <laughs> and, or that could even relate to the tons and tons and tons of stories that my grandfather shared. And as you and I were talking this summer, and I'm telling you uh, about the town, you're like, oh yeah, my great grandfather founded that town. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> it's <You're> amazing. <laughs> Method, North Carolina. <laughs> and you were the very first person that ever knew anything about Method, North Carolina when I would tell the story of my grandfather. And I bring that up because there was another kind of really first connection that I had. And that was after I did my dissertation work which was on using IFA or the Yoruba-based system, spirit, indigenous spiritual system as a mental health intervention. And I didn't really think that it was something that was like super groundbreaking. And I remember after doing my presentation, you came up to me at one of the events and you were like, you're brave for doing this. And I was like thinking everybody does this. And we had this whole conversation and that was like really like the first time that we connected of you just telling me that I was brave and I, I didn't realize what I was doing at that moment. And so ever since then, you have just been like a warm spirit and I appreciate all of the work that you have done in this field. I want to start out just asking you a question where we just start kind of that plain old mental health, um, Western psychology field. How did you make the journey to becoming a Western trained psychologist? Okay, so I'm going to try to make it short because okay. it could go on. You know, as we all say, you know, I chose that journey before I got here. That's mm -hmm. the short answer of it. However, I was raised by grandparents. Um, the the, the daughter of my great grandfather who helped to found that, um, uh, who was into caring for people. And so mm -hmm. in so doing, at some point, she realized that she wanted to move out of working for others and formed her own daycare center in our house. And so um, on the first floor of our house, she had all these lovely, beautiful children that I felt were mine. I thought she brought them there for me. And so as I went through school, she told me that when I got ready to go to college, um, that I needed to do something that dealt with children. However, you know how teenagers are. What does she know? So I decided to be an accountant because in school, they told me that's where you made the money. And that's where my goal was. Um, so I went on, came out, 
got into psychology, of course, in undergrad, nothing relates to anything. Uh, went to a master's level. Um, you know, it started being a little interesting, but it wasn't until I decided to go to the doctoral level program that I could see how I could take this, this uh, passion to be able to work with it long term. By then, of course, ABCI had been um, uh, formed. I had thought I had joined ABCI, but found out that I was in the Black Student Psychological Association, which was APA. But still, our group always traveled to listen to the speakers of ABCI. And so um, I was really, I had an impact of those like, um, you know, Bobby Wright, Naeem Akbar, Asa Hillier, Wade Nobles, um, on and on and on and on. Uh, the hair, uh, uh, brother and sister, Julia Hare and her husband. Nathan that a lot, and Julia. Some people didn't like because she was so, yeah, Nathan, because, you know, she was so outspoken, you know, um, and there were so many there. But I only went to here and I got filled and would come back home. At some point, I decided, well, to get involved. You know, you just can't keep doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, but by then, I was already on the road to the training of being a psychologist. By being outspoken as I am, I got asked to be the first General Assembly chair. And, um, and that was in 1990, I think, 89, 90. We had started to plan, or uh, somebody brought up the idea that we needed to have a conference overseas. And uh, I said Ghana. And my good sister, uh, uh, Patricia said, no, Senegal. Well, we can see who won. <laughs> <laughs> so who would know? <laughs> right. So who would think that 10 years later, I would be the president of ABCI who would, who would lead that journey to Ghana, West Africa? It was a humongous experience for all of us. And so, um, but Prior to that, I had been myself uh, to Ghana on several occasions. We just talked about my trip in 1972 as a young, bright-eyed student, you know, just getting on a plane, not even knowing where I was going to stay. We didn't know where we were going to stay when we got off that plane. You know, we just gone, you know, gone to Africa. And so all of that, you know, even those parts encouraged this journey to be uh, African psychologist, African-centered psychologist. You know, so I claim my blackness as a black psychologist and I claim my African centeredness. Um, and all of those experiences contributed to that. And so it's important. You, you said you claim yourself as a black psychologist and an African centered psychologist. When how do you distinguish yourself as an African centered psychologist versus the Western training you have as a psychologist? Well, you know, the way we, our worldview is significantly different. African-centered psychology is holistic. And even though APA is trying to claim so, some of this with their meaningfulness or mindfulness, um, it's not the same. They are linear people. They're competitive. They don't work in the cooperative way. Um, we're circular. We're not linear. Um, we care about our individualness as it contributes to the whole, not just what I get out of things. So in European psychology, it's always about pathology. What is wrong with them? What, you know, what is the problem? There's not enough understanding of a culture to even be able to see the diagnosis differently. So for example, you know, in both the spiritual work and the, the psychology work, because I practice the spirituality and because I'm African centered, there may be people who come to me who might receive a diagnosis of um, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. but where I see it, it's a misalignment with their spirits. And so therefore the work to try to get that balance, which is also different. We work on balance and harmony in, in our African centered approach, mm -hmm. not on medication and things of that nature. So looking at those things and working toward helping the people restore the person, the people to restore balance is the 
holistic approach, which can come by through rhythm, through collectivism, through um, um, calling on our ancestors, uh, being able in so many ways to use the resources of our culture to define and to serve who we are. And the questions are different. It's not what is going on, it's why is it occurring at this time? Mm. So we look back at intergenerational issues um, that brought it to you. We look at it particularly why you've come to me. You know, somebody led you here because I'm very different from even other black psychologists. And so often in my practice, I find the opportunity to move to people to understand that their ancestors are still a part of who they are, a part of who, you know, who is in their DNA, who is in their blood and that they sent them to be able to work out the issues that typically have been multi-generation and that it needs to stop now. So that's a major difference between the things. Uh, I had someone call the other day who was working with someone and, and she left her, she was a psychiatrist, she left her therapist because of all the Eurocentric terms that she was using. And she didn't know anything about african centered but she knew that that worked against her because she's in that field. And so the woman said, oh, boundaries, boundaries, she said. And so, you know, those are not things we talk about in African-centered approach. You just said something that st sticks out to me. And I, I was actually saying this to my colleagues that were on with us yesterday about people's ancestors. So when clients show up that their ancestors are sending them to to us. And I firmly believe that. And I don't know, it, it, Spirit just told me that. Um, and so, okay, that's not something that Western trained psychologists say, but I'm very clear about that, that sometimes I'm sitting across from somebody and there are too many coincidences. Those things can't just happen. And I'm very, very clear that their ancestors have sent them to me. And I'm also very clear that they're <laughs> there are people that show up and you're right. They don't know anything about African-centered psychology, but they know what they've been getting before it doesn't work. So for example, I will get people that will say, I went to this therapist and they were giving me these sheets and they were telling me to, uh, about changing my thoughts. And then they tell me all these things about changing my thoughts and changing my behavior. And, but that stuff didn't work. And I just will like chuckle. <laughs> Because I know what they're talking about. I mean, they're, they're oftentimes talking about these cognitive behavioral interventions. And they're like, they work for a short period of time, but those things don't work over the long haul. And one of the things that you just said also that really stuck with me is around like people getting diagnoses of schizophrenia. That's part of when I was doing my dissertation research, I was really looking at how do you distinguish or... Do you ever make a distinguish between someone that might have a spiritual experience and we, you need to deal with that kind of from a traditional perspective versus someone that you may think has an organic mental illness? Or do you see a cross between those two things? Or maybe not. Uh, usually a cross. And I'm more leaning toward the spiritual. Everything is spirit. We're all spirit. Mm -hmm. So how has it shown up? You know, that's what I said. Why? How has it shown up? And what then do we need to do about it? So um, so since I'm not traditional, I rarely work in that realm. I'm not cognitive behavioral. And it, which is interesting when I when I have to supervise students and have to try to think along that way so that they can pass their practicum <laughs> or internship. Um, um, so, you know, and like, oh, my gosh, there's a reason that, you know, and I tell them there's a reason to get your doctorate so that you can then uh, dictate and guide the, the uh, conversation around these issues. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't get this in my graduate program, you know, nor did I, through all the years I've been in psychology since uh, undergrad, and I've been through a master's program and a doctoral program. Um, but fortunately, I never went the APA route, or maybe I shouldn't say that. I always, when I came out, my, my family was a black family. And so the way they were talking during our time, you know, during the late sixties and seventies, it was revolutionary time. 
So, mm -hmm. you know, I went there and, you know, there were people coming to the conferences that had nothing to do with psychology. They just wanted to hear these speakers speak. And so it resonated in me, too, that they were speaking my, my talk. But we mm -hmm. also recognized that we were only, and although we needed to see and understood there needed to be a change in psychology, what we often talk about is that we were putting black paint on white psychology, you know, just changing the words, et cetera, but using basically the same foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was until, um, you know, uh, the late 90s that we really began really to get to the early 90s, where we began to recognize that um, it was something different and that we already had that because our people had existed in this world for thousands of years. And so they dealt with the same kinds of issues. So why are we not looking at the source and the foundation for these things rather than someone else's interpretation? So for example, we know that in um, neuropsychology, Western psychology, they often gravitate toward Jung. Well, we know that Jung interpreted a lot of his formulation from his trips to Africa. Mm -hmm. And so again, a lot of black students seem to like Jung, even if they didn't practice um, uh, psychoanalysis. And it's because it resonated with something within. They all, we also resonated with things that didn't sound so pathological. Of course, you had people who sometimes got off and just wanted to be a white psychologist and really didn't focus on whether or not it served us. But for me, I was fortunate enough to want to try to find something that would serve us and would serve me because my spirit had to be a part of this work. And so I looked at the many things mm -hmm. that brought about um, uh, an understanding. So looking at spirituality, collectivism, um, how rhythm is a part of it, how, how recognizing the past, the present, and the future helped us with our function. Those were the things that mattered in African psychology that did, I did not find in Western psychology. And you, you just pointed out um, one thing is Jung taking <laughs> lots of stuff from African psychology and doing this. He did this really kind of interesting dance of pathologizing people of African ancestry. You can read some of his writings where he talked very negatively, particularly about African-Americans. And <clears throat> most people don't realize that Jung was actually the president of, I, I have to get it in, and I'll put it in the chat, is like the German Medical Society. So there was, he was comrades with, uh, good friends with Freud. And then there was this big break. And so then um, the Nazis were trying to come up with this kind of way of, of basically an Aryan psychology. And he was the president of that organization. And so every time when people try to do what you say, of like kind of put these black paint on white psychology, and they love to point out Yoon and the collective unconscious and his things about archetypes. And I was like, yeah, but that dude was repping for the Nazis. So go ahead with that, but just be clear that you're following somebody that's repping for the Nazis. And I think that that's the thing is that we can't just look at psychology and simply say, like, take these things from other people that have taken them from us in the first place and then put black paint on it and think it's OK. We have to be able to look at the healing of our people from an African centered lens and using African psychology. So, I mean, you talked about a couple of things, drum and dance and kind of community collectivist uh, engagement. Tell us about what does that look like in terms of the work that you are doing with clients in your practice? Well, you know, um, so in many different ways, it's a holistic approach and that the uh, collectivism, as we talk about inviting those ancestors and understanding that this issue is not yours if you're in family, where has it come from and where is it continuing from your living family? You know, and how can we help bring about balance? And so, you know, there are many different ways. You know, a lot of people are very isolated and, and, and withdrawn, et cetera. So you think about dance and drumming and those kinds of things that resonate and tap into the spirit and help it rise 
so that they can be, be effective in your journey. We talk about, oh, um, um, uh, you know, I do, I'm very well known for my guided meditation. You know, so in my journeys, I help people go back to uh, areas to reclaim. So we're not really always going back to the pathological experience, but we do come into allowing their spirit to connect with them, to guide them. And so therefore the intent, so yes, we do know we have ancestors that did not always do well here, but we have helped them and guide them into places where they can retrieve and receive information that will help the work that I'm doing with them so that they understand that eventually they'll be the ones in control. You won't be here lifelong. This is not a lifelong journey to be in therapy with me. And so, <laughs> but you didn't ask, how does that work on the outside? So for, for therapists who may be on the call, you know, you don't necessarily have to be initiated, but you do need to ask claim that. your own identity. Mm -hmm. You have to claim your own identity as an African person. And even if you don't use the word African as a black person, you know, deep in the roots here, you know, in here in North Carolina and Mississippi, Alabama, our people understood how we work with nature and how nature informs us. And we use nature to assist us in balance. And so some of the, you know, so and you mentioned before the different things that happen in cognitive um, behavioral therapy where they give them lists and books to read and all this kind of stuff. I had a client, a new client yesterday. He said, I hope you're not going to, I read your website and I hope you're not going to give me a book list to read and all these other kinds of things that I've been finding. So yeah, I said, no, your work is here. And when you leave here, there may be homework to do. So for one, there were so many different people. So I did have them do a genogram so I could follow these people. But I'm not into that kind of homework. I'm into the homework where you go out in nature, you take off your shoes and you walk on that grass and you mm -hmm. let Asasiya, Mother Earth, help you find balance, foundation and restoration. You sit in the sun and take in that vitamin D because it's more than just for the vitamin intake. It's because that, that stimulates the melanin in you. And the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. The more you take in, the more it sees. And that's not saying anything against any of our multiplicity of, of in our race. But that those are things that nature provided us to be able to be whole and well. And if you've come to me, I think that it's because there's an understanding in the universe that this person can assist to guide you in that direction. But for, and for those of us who may not be initiated, you know, create a space where they see black people. Don't have up just flowers on paintings and stuff. Let them feel the energy in your office. Have some music, some drumming music when they come in the door, any kind of African music, you know. Even if you mm -hmm. use Coltrane from here or something. But somebody mm -hmm. that resonates with who we are. Also, you know, um, in let them know that you connect with them. So mm -hmm. as you hear their stories, you know, we know as psychologists that sometimes somebody who walks in the door is a mirror for you. So sometimes yes. I, I'll say, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, a, you know, like even our connection with method, you know, mm -hmm. that's a deep uh, connection going back to my great grandfather, you know, helping to found the town where your great great grandfather. So, and all of those people knew each other. And I remember going yeah. there as a small child running around. You didn't have to be in. That's the first time I didn't have to be in by the time the lights, you know, went off because they didn't have any, <laughs> you know, all of that kind of stuff. You could run around, you know, you could be free. Our spirits are meant to be free. And we're in cages in apartments. We're in cages in work. We're in cages in so many places that we need the freedom. So, I encourage black therapists to create that free space for those who come to see them and not get locked into the training you receive that does not serve us. So if, what would you say to a psychologist or a mental health professional uh, that says, well, Dr. Campbell, I'm, I'm uncomfortable talking about ancestors. I don't know much about, I mean, I know I have ancestors, but I don't know much about 
uh, incorporating that into the therapeutic process? How would you tell them to start? Okay. Well, first of all, believe me, when they walk through the door, that's not my first conversation. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want anybody even <laughs> that they've read my website. They see me because I'm always dressed in African attire, but that's not my first conversation. It's, it's pretty typical. I, my assessment is very different. And so, you know, since I'm uh, online, my assessment is there. So they get to go through it. And I ask okay. questions that I can use to try to figure out where they are. You know, so I want to know their position in the family of birth. You know, as a, if you had five children, what position were you? Of course, I want to know your birth date. I want to know, um, uh, you know, the strengths of, of your upbringing. Who was in the house? Who helped to raise you? All of those kinds of things, because those are the foundation. And that also helps me. So ancestors, I invite in before they even get there. You know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know who's coming. So, you know, I do a libation, which people need to know is just pouring a little um, drink and inviting them to my answers, join with theirs to assist this person. So that's mm -hmm. where it starts. And then it's just pretty typical for the first session, maybe. You know, you may get to the end of the session. We've already talked about it. Because often I will say... Um, um, You know, something like, um, well, you know, tell me a little bit about who's still living in your family and who's passed away that may have been an influence to you. Uh, so, so how many other ancestors do you know that were influential in your family? So it could be mm -hmm. something as benign as that. And then mm -hmm. I take it from there to engage them to assist in this process. So with those who aren't initiated, you may not engage, but believe me, they will help you even if you, once you open the door, even if you don't know to. So you, if you don't know how to. So if you're not afraid, they're certainly not afraid to help. You. And mm -hmm. I can't say enough how important it is for Black people to go back to our cultural foundations, to our worldview, to work with our people. People get excited. I had uh, so by second yep. session, they come back to me and say, wow, my spouse, my business, I've changed just in two sessions, you know, and there's nothing magical. All, although I joke when they want something fantastic to occur, I said, well, I broke my magic wand. So it's just, just you and me, <laughs> you, know? Now, you know, and those that we invite in here. So, um, you know, so that's how I would encourage people to start. You be comfortable first. Find out about your own blackness. Find out about your own history. This isn't a profession. This isn't a job. This is mm -hmm. a life work when you guide and work with our people. I sure. I and sure. so you must take it with that kind of a love in mind. Well, and, and I think that's a clear distinction between African-centered psychology and, and kind of our Western training. In Western training programs, when at least when I was going through, you were encouraged, you weren't required to do therapy. So you weren't required to do your own work. So there's this idea of like, we can break down things in these components, I can pour it into you. And once I pour it into you, boom, you become a psychologist as opposed to from an African center perspective, in order for you to teach someone how, how uh, about good character, you gotta have good character on your own. You gotta be able to do the work in order to be able to guide someone. Just because you get older does not mean that you are an elder. It means that you have gone through a particular right, you have gone through a particular process. And that, I think that is, is just the distinction in those two things. So what you're saying is really important is that, that part of this process is if you wanna help people connect with their ancestors, start for yourself. One of the things that I do when I do workshops, anything that's on ancestral connections is I have, I take a long time and have people introduce themselves. And usually, you know, at the beginning of workshops when people introduce themselves, they're like, ah, but, they don't get to talk about all this, you know, fancy degrees and all that kind of stuff. I want to know who your people is. 
So I tell people, I start by introducing myself and I say who my parents are, my grandparents, my great grandparents, my great great grandparents. And I just make it easier for them. I just go up to your great, to your grandparents. I just, or your great grandparents. I just want to know who they are. Like, tell me who your people are. And so something just as simple as that is you being clear about who you came from, I think is significant. I see a question here and yeah, so if other people have questions, definitely put them in the chat. I would be happy to ask Dr. Campbell on those questions. So uh, LaToya is asking, is there a book or reference? LaToya, tell me a little bit more. Is a, a book or reference in general in African-centered psychology or are you talking about a specific subject for Dr. Campbell? So why she's putting that in, um, I'm wondering. Well, is let, there... let me answer that even without her being specific, because I okay. can refer her to one that I think is great for um, practitioners as well as, um, um, you know, our general population. It's Self-Healing okay. Power and Therapy by yeah. Nganga Fukiao. That's F-U-K-I-A-U. Mm -hmm. Self-healing power, the, the book before that is on African cosmology. Then you kind of understand, you know, that's from the Congo. You kind of understand how all of our worldview works, because even though that's from the Congo, it's very similar throughout the continent. And so he's put it in writing. You know, we have a similar uh, concept in, in the Akan, you know, understanding what the circle of life looks like. So he's just drawing it out on a map, but self-healing power and therapy helps you understand the foundation of where your healing comes from. So therefore you will know when something's going wrong and what needs to occur in order to do that. So that's one of the um, great books that I would recommend. And uh, Don Cora's On Becoming Ancestors, that's yes. another one. You know, it's again, a cosmology on understanding that as you mentioned, you know, there's a process to becoming an elder and all old people don't become elders. And so as all, even though people go into the ancestral realm, there are different places, for lack of a better word, that people go. You know, I want to get back to this point you made that I think is so important. Before I even became initiated, I would have a study group at our cultural center and people would come from the different, and mainly the different colleges around St. Um, uh, uh, NC State, a and Shaw. And one of the things that I pushed for most was don't worry about any of this stuff, develop good character. Once you develop good character, then that would guide you. I'm doing initiations now and I talked to the brother who assisted me and that I work on trying to have impeccable character. Does that mean I don't, I do something, I don't ever do anything wrong? That's absolutely not true, I think, no. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I try to work on developing good character and hold myself accountable. So when I have people coming at me with a lot of different negative things, my, my response to that is, that's not my business. You know, if they want to be ugly or create, you know, ill things, there's too much going on in the world that I'm responsible for. So I'm not going to worry about that. I have to maintain good character at all times. And I taught them that regardless of any of these things you do, good character reigns high. And so you'll see even a lot of these traditions, you'll see people doing things that seem out of order for what they should be doing. So those of us who are in it know that everybody has their path you know, and that they're chosen for many different reasons. But just mm -hmm. as we're saying, you look for, a, you go and research your, your, your therapist, you need to mm -hmm. research your, your diviner as well. Because, oh, you know, you'll get to know in an interview. And I encourage uh, clients to interview their therapist to make sure mm -hmm. that you're compatible. So you're both not wasting time. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean that you hit the nail on the head. Interview your therapist, and if you have a therapist that's offended that you're interviewing them, then that's not the therapist for you. Or if you're working with someone that is a traditional or spiritual healer, then you definitely want to interview that person. You don't want to find somebody randomly online. 
Absolutely. I don't know, Mama um, Mui, I don't know if you've heard of this, but I hear like there are these, um, so th I don't think these people that contact folks, they'll direct message them on online and tell them that they need a reading and do all this like little scary stuff. It's really, really bad now. Those are folks that you never mm -hmm. want to You know, I'm not online. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a big thing now, like, you know, and so people were all like all in these scare tactics. I did this reading on you. Or I saw your picture online and you need this reading. You send me three hundred dollars now or you're going to die. It is huge. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, I Ooh. mean, they, they are all in all in on this. So that is something that you should absolutely never do. I always tell people that you always need to take recommendations from other people. And then you need to interview that that person. And if you feel like they have like glaring character issues, then believe yourself, trust yourself. And that's not the person for you to work with. Absolutely. in doing this work. So since you went down that road, let's talk about the work that you do as an Akan um, priest um, or an Akampo. It, are there things that you do that you incorporate into therapy that people that are not initiated cannot do? Uh, yes, you know, um, I'm not so sure in the therapy room, but okay. um, because I look the way I look, people always think that there's more to it and <laughs> will inquire. <laughs> And what you so got for me, lady? It may, huh? I said they say, "What you got for me, lady?" I know you got some, some herbs and right. some. <laughs> so I had an elder come to me once, uh, sister, um, and you know, very Christian, and of course, her Christian congregation told her she didn't need a therapist. You know, she, all she needed to do was trust um, in that person. And so she said, well, I know God brought you here, too. And he brought you to me because I felt it. You know, so, um, so at one point we had to wind up giving her a bath, a spiritual bath, you know, so which was so, you know, out of. So, but what I equated it to, I said, well, you know, don't the Baptists give baths? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know don't the Methodists? sprinkle water on you you know don't the catholics do something like that sprinkle i said so before they existed your people existed and so where do you think they got got the concepts from mm. to know that that was a process of healing mm. but they warded it down excuse the pun <laughs> mm -hmm. and so now you have the opportunity to receive you know, um, what what we do in order to provide the protection around you that is needed while you're still working out the problem. It in and of itself may not work out the problem. Some things are, you know, like that. But it's, you know, people look at us as if we're, we got this um, magic wand and you come, mm -hmm. you find out and your life is supposed to change or your problem is supposed to go away immediately. But it requires work on all yeah. realms, and it's your connectedness with those realms that help you to get to where. So, yes, somebody may get a job as a result of coming, but is that really your total purpose? Because, you know, that job may come. You may be happy for a while, but your life may not have changed that drastically. People need to commit to their lives, their own lives, not to just those who can assist them with that process. Because that's the way they need to see it as assistance. Um, mm -hmm. So you asked me what I bring into it. Um, uh, there have been times when people have come in with what the Westerners would consider psychotic breaks. Mm -hmm. So then they, I have to do something right then. And so I do. I take them into another room and do some things to get them, you know, in alignment so that they can walk out, walk out of my office, not walk mm -hmm. into a hospital. And so I have, you know, at least several people who may have been diagnosed that way that um, that I've had to work with that Western psychology would not have been able to. Not are, there any, are there any 
people um, that you've had that experience with where you weren't able to help them? Uh, not yet, but I don't, I'm not trying to say I have a whole lot of them, you know, not <laughs> in that kind of state. Um, okay. But yes, I've had people I've not been able to help, but um, mm -hmm. not in that particular state. You know, there's only been a few of them that have come in that, um, that, you know, that uh, challenged. And I always talk about challenges in my practice. I don't talk about weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about disorders. I want to see how life is challenging them at this point and what are, and how can we work to resolve those challenges. Now you said something about um, giving, you had, had the one client that you had to give a bath. Talk a little bit about that. Cause like, as soon as you say that kind of stuff, you know, our Western training is like, no, you hear that Western word boundaries. Well, but that's not, again, that's not in psychology, you know? So uh -huh. that happened as we continue on and that is mm -hmm. not something that would be recommended for anybody who's not initiated you know, they may refer and i remember in the early days you used to refer people to to others you know mm -hmm. and when we talk more about it to understand that you know uh you're aren't you trained <laughs> so and i hear that i was on a conference call with the akan recently where that mm -hmm. subject came up and one brother talked about oh you can't do that because we're licensed to do this. Well, he's young in this field. So mm -hmm. there was no argument to be made. You know, again, I encourage people to get the PhD so you can be your own young, your mm -hmm. own you, or your own Sullivan or, or any of those. Or only fatality or Right, yeah. right. You develop your own theories based on, you know, your, your, um, your analysis of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and even the methods by which it gets proved aren't going to be the same methods that they use. Exactly. The methods that we use, you know, as we talked about in uh, our joint association, is that the standards that we use will probably be more stringent than the ones they use because we're mm -hmm. concerned about those who come through us. Yes. Being able to work with our, our people. Absolutely. You know? So you can go yeah. work for others and they may say they give you a rubber stamp because you went through this CE training or that. But when you come through African centered, then the, then the ancestors need to uh, decide that you're prepared to move forward. Yeah. And I think what you just said is significant. So for myself, although I am initiated, I am not a working priest and I don't do overt things for people. I mean, I end up talking a lot about ancestors. Um, that ends up, I think that's just kind of who I am. Is and My last name says it all. That's My last name means someone who's initiated to the ancestral society. So, so I'm always dealing with that piece. But in terms of like divining or doing other kinds of rituals for people, I don't do that work. And so I have specific people that I refer to and they do that work. And that's very different than a psychologist that not only works as a Western trained psychologist, but then is also a working priest and is able to do those things and being able to have the experience of being able to distinguish that. And I think that's the point that I wanted to get across because like you were saying, I mean, you may have a young, younger psychologist that may have those divisions um, in their mind. And I don't necessarily have that division for myself. It is, but that is a personal choice versus being able to understand how do you professionally work with your clients from a mental health perspective in terms of our training, and then also appropriately work with those clients in terms of the spiritual work that needs to be done and being able to get the consent. I think that is, I mean, that would be actually a great article to be able to write on that mm -hmm. whole subject because these are things that we're that I think we need to explore we reach, really need to be able to talk about you look like and you're I'd like to speak a little bit more on that because even the whole con concept of how we work with ourselves in this profession versus how we work with ourselves as individual puts us in a western frame because mm -hmm. holistically you can't separate who you are mm -hmm. who you are transfers to everything in this society you know you go to work you do that job you come home and you be yourself you know? mm -hmm. which creates problems for us 
because mm -hmm. that's not the kind of people we are. All of what we do is who we are. And even if you're, you know, an uh, electrician, we know that there are spirits who, who dealt with lightning and energy. And we know that they're, you know, metal workers. You know, I saw a long line of people in my family that dealt with, like my great grandfather. So I know that this work came out of my line. My great grandmothers were, um, were midwives. So they dealt with healing work beyond just delivering babies, you know, because we know that that's what that work is. But when we come into, because we're conditioned to see ourselves separately and dichotomously, it's very difficult to bring the work together. So we're, I'm not suggesting that a psychologist work as an initiated priest or even as an initiated person, but the fact that you were born initiated you into a life of being an African person, mm -hmm. which in and of itself bestowed upon you certain rights and understandings that other people don't have. But oh. you've not been trained or conditioned to understand how that can work for you and your people. And so, you know, even if your parents and grandparents saw that little glimmer of this child is special, they worked to suppress it because they didn't want other people to see it and think one either that you're crazy or two that we're going to get in trouble so i have an initiate who said her grandmother um, who lives here came from liberia and she would do offerings in her backyard and so she lived in the city <laughs> and so people would see it and then she had to deal with all that because her grandmother because she wasn't raised and conditioned and schooled here didn't have an understanding that there was a separate part of her. So she mm -hmm. continued her life as she had always done. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm not recommending that, you know, people do offerings, you know, in their practice, you know, <laughs> but there are different ways of offering, you know, that you also consider that you are a whole being and you don't, especially in this work, take off your psychology hat and put on an initiate's hat. It's not the same. You are that person all the time. Mm. There are limits in terms of, you know, what people come to receive, you know, what they're paying to receive. And you have mm -hmm. to be aware of that. You cannot mm. overstep where they are because it's not about you. It's about them. Mm. And so ah. even though you are this person, you cannot take you into that part of them that they're not prepared to receive. So okay. it's no wonder the kinds of people. So yesterday I got a new client that was referred who just started dabbling in Yoruba. We understand that there's no separation between these families. I'm not a Yoruba. He didn't come to me to, to guide him that way. He came to help for me to help guide him in that he's coming to an understanding of himself beyond the Western training uh, of life that he's received. And so I'm not here to talk to him about Arisha. Uh -huh. I don't know enough about them. And I'm not here to talk to him about the Obosun. I'm here to help guide him in his healing work that he can then rely, go back and use some of what he has learned to assist him in that process. Uh, as you were talking, the thing that came to me about the, so thank you for, I mean, that's clearly even for me about that, that it's all one there's no separation is in my office when we were in the office before this you know pandemic killing everybody i have an ancestral altar and it's right in the middle of the office and it's of the women my female ancestors and i have this candy dish on there and the staff would like try to like you know regulate the candy dish or like i don't know it's an altar can they eat the candy and i was like no just that's that's what it's for like my grandparents, my grandmother's always had a candy dish. That is what it's for. It's it's that energy. And it's just there. And people ask about it. And there's a picture of my mother on there. And I look exactly like my mother. So then they get confused because they're like, why are you on the ancestor altar? And I'm like, no, that's my mom. <laughs> but and it's just, and no matter who comes in the office, they have to walk past it. And I'm like, and they ask me what it is. It's my ancestor altar. I'm like, all right. It just is what it is. So I, I think and that they have a choice. If it freaks them out and they don't want to come in, <laughs> they get to make another choice. Right. 
And actually, that so that's all over my office. Like in the lobby, we had an, another altar that just kind of spontaneously came, and you know, people were like, "Oh, what's that? It's an altar." <laughs> And I think it sets the tone so, for what people can expect. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. Recently on Black Therapy Center, we had we had it. Um, we didn't initiate it because it came from um, the spiritual work. This global ancestral veneration day, mm. and it came about as a result of what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, to us as a people, the, you know, things that we're dealing with as a people. And so typically there's an ancestral veneration time around June, uh, around the country that are, so I got calls from people saying, well, why are we doing this? You know, as if we can't have multiple ones, they need to be venerated every day, particularly. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what you've done is allowed for an opportunity for people to just witness Mm -hmm. something that they may not have witnessed before. And one young lady who got really involved with this um, was, was a client of mine, um, wanted to do it in her hometown. So she's not a priest. She's not initiated. She's just finding out about it. So she got her community together to build mm -hmm. an altar that she said hundreds of people came by. And so, wow. you know, it gave opportunity for people to connect in ways with just so-called lay people, you know, that mm -hmm. um, understand that this is a part of who we are as a people. It is not because you're initiated in society. It's not because you practice an African spiritual system. It's because you are African, you know, and I want to do a clarification on that because sometimes we have people who say, well, you know, we understand the word is not the correct word. We understand that we had indigenous people here on this land, we are all one. And so the original foundation was from that landmass, and then we traveled out from that. So understand that no matter where you are in your blackness, in your was it, woke state, in your conscious state, all of that stuff, mm -hmm. that we are one people, and that we accept the responsibility for being one people in the healing process, as well in trying to rid us of pathology that, that works against us. And sometimes mm -hmm. times that can happen within the context of our office, but sometimes it needs to be more global, more community, and more outward. And our therapists certainly be ought, ought to be at the front of trying to create space where people can understand healing can occur. Well, I think what, you, what you're saying is important because we're oftentimes we're doing this work at one on one. But then you started out and you're talking about kind of the foundation of African centered psychology is community. And so that's part of, you know, the push, the thing that we always have to consider. How do we involve the community? Uh, how do we involve the family in the healing process? And that 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 becomes the challenge of this attempt. Um, it's all, almost like you remember. So when I was little, we had these Tupperware things. It was like this yellow tube and it had this blue top. And it had like a square and a circle and a whatever, different shapes. And you had to put the little blocks into the right shape and it wouldn't go in. It, you know, if you tried to put the square into the circle, it wouldn't go in. And that, I think, is what we're doing in this process of trying to fit an African reality, our African identity into this Western model. So it doesn't quite fit like an edge can go in, but there's always something wrong and it doesn't feel comfortable. And that that's part of the work that we're doing is trying to create this space where our people can fit, that it does feel comfortable, that it, it feels Absolutely. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that is really a great example of it. And we mask it a lot. And so we walk around with the stress because we're trying to let the world think that we're all, all right in this space. But then mm -hmm. when we're left out, you know, we look over our shoulder and things like that, we're not totally accepted. And my concern is why we keep trying to be accepted into something that's so foreign, so alienating to us. You know, mm -hmm. that indeed is, to me, a, a pathological way of living in life. And it ought to be a DSM diagnosis. <laughs> um, living in a society, both the victim, 
Yeah, both the victim and the perpetrators. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to have some diagnosis that matter, those are some of them that really matter because those are the ones that create the stress, the um, uh, especially now the complex stress that we're dealing with, you know, you know the trauma, right. all of those kinds of things. Why do we force ourselves to continue to live and work within environments that completely are alienate, alienated um, against us and alienating our own spirits so that we can't. So we don't know this, first of all. We don't know why we feel this. But racism is a diagnosable um, uh, effect, has the diagnosable, what is it? They need to put it in the DSM-5. Mm -hmm. if you use that you know so i mean as psychologists we're still forced to go to that book in order to get paid um but mm -hmm. i try to and this is real important i try not to find the worst diagnosis to put on a person what mm -hmm. is the least one that still fits those symptoms that they occur mm -hmm. what is going to mm -hmm. be less harmful to, to them as they move through life mm -hmm. those that you mentioned before those schizophrenia you know, usually lead to medicine immediately and mm -hmm. when we know in this work that when they start taking medicine, it becomes much more difficult for us to reach their spirits and to restore them. And there yeah. are rarely occasions where people who have been diagnosed that way and who have received medication and been hospitalized have been able to fully restore. But if they haven't gone that way, we've seen many that have been restored. When one of the people that I interviewed for my dissertation um, was a really a senior Bob Lau, and one of the things that he described what he was saying, what you were saying, he described it in a different way. He said, so they use the metaphor of like people have gone to the market. So if we can catch you before you go to the market, um, i.e. if we can catch you before you take the medication, we might be able to do something. Once you've gone to the market, uh, other, in other words, once you've taken the medication, it's, it's going to be really hard for us to be able to do anything and get you back whole. So that, that I mean, that's just but always. Medicine is so strong. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It alters, it alters the pathways. So yeah. there's no way you, your, your healing mechanism is this vessel that you, that your mm -hmm. spirit lives. In. And when you start to alter it in any way from, you know, I'm not even going down the list because I know most of the people have done something and I don't want them to feel <laughs> like, you know, but um, we've been conditioned into this uh, medical model because yes. it's the highest um, paid industry in the world. Mm -hmm. That conditioning is not to help restore you, but to keep you attached. To you. So do you mm -hmm. really want to be restored? But also we understand that some of our people need, feel they need that because that's the only place where they get real attention. You know, going to visit the doctor. They always talk about their visit to the I went to the doctor this week, especially as they get older. And we, mm -hmm. you know, unlike Africa, here in this society, we cast our elders aside. In Africa, elders are revered. Babies coming into the world and elders are revered. And it make, gives them a special place. And I took someone, you know, I do the Sankofa journey every year. And we yeah. took a group one year and one of the brothers said he wanted to invest in uh, Ghana and he just saw an industry that would work because he didn't see any old folks home. That's what he could do. And I had to tell him <laughs> it won't work here because in Africa, if you tried to put an elder outside the family, they would do everything they could to destroy you. Because mm -hmm. the family would be ostracized by the community, as well as the children who put them. In. So you don't mm -hmm. see them because they don't exist. Elders mm -hmm. die within the family, which yes. is where they belong. Yes. And the difference, of course, is here we are so invested in because it requires working to have money to buy stuff that we can't afford to be home to take care of, and we don't live in communities anymore. So there they have communities where somebody comes by and does things for the elder when they're not able to do it for themselves anymore. But I've seen so many elders there who kind of you know, just worked up until, I mean, walked, talked up until the day before they left here because life is so rich for them. They can tell you, you know, and some of ours here too, 
okay, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm tired. Mm-hmm. They start talking about being tired. And then you know that they're preparing for their journey. And so yeah. instead of mourning for them, you celebrate the life they have. And uh, that's another thing that is different. In um, a society that we live in, that is full of racism and stuff like that, it, there's a need to separate the family. And so yeah. as we see now with this COVID, if you have an uh, a elder or a sick one in the hospital, you can't even visit them. When we know that that connection helps to heal. Mm-hmm. So what are they saying to us? They're taking a person and allowing them to die yeah. in an unhealthy, unabnormal way. And at this yeah. point, we are not aware enough to know that it can happen different and it should happen. Yeah. But we're not in control of our own places and our own spaces. And I mean that mentally as well as physically. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. When I was in Nigeria, the times that I've gone into Nigeria, there, I mean, definitely, and I was in rural areas of Nigeria. So I noticed that there was no like babysitters or daycares, children were taken care of on, I was, I stayed on a huge compound. And so the mothers would literally, they'd be going somewhere, they'd get in the car and go somewhere and they didn't even think twice about the children because somebody was going to take care of the children. There was always tons of people around to take care of the children. There was tons, there was elders there and they were just taken care of. People made sure that they had enough to eat, um, that whatever they needed, it, w- it was just that that was just done. And my godfather at one point asked me, he was just asking, you know, just why do women, you know, in the U.S., um, African-American women don't want to have more children. And he's been here before. And I, one of the things I was telling him, I was like, bye bye, you know, it's hard. Just as simple, like financially and, you know, childcare, there's so many things that you have to think about. And so, you know, where they have these really huge families that it becomes uh, difficult for you to navigate those systems in the U.S. because of everything that's put on us and on top of us living through racism, sexism, and white supremacy. Um, There was something, I kind of wanted to shift gears and ask you about something that okay. you said. To well, me. Let me just You're- make one point about that as you talk about racism, sexism. Love. All of those contribute to the way that we live. You know, yeah. so it's not that we're living and these things are put on us. They contribute to the choices that we're left to make. So you talked about method before. That's not mm-hmm. the way it was in method. That was a community where everybody looked out for each other. And the mm-hmm. ch- like I said, the children ran around all day long. Nobody looked for them. You go eat in whoever's house, you know, mm-hmm. which is different because I was raised in Connecticut, you know. You know, you didn't have that thing. I mean, it was more open and free than living in New York. But that kind of community, and they did have community, but it wasn't, you couldn't just be going in people's houses. You couldn't be eating their food because the resources were limited. So I wanted to point that out, that we have contributed ourselves to living in an environment that have been conditioned on us that keep us separate, which means healing is difficult to occur in those environments. Mm, oh, goodness. Okay, before I even get to my other question, but I'm going to get to that question because I got to ask you that. You, oh, gosh, you just brought me back to a story my grandfather was telling in me. Um, he, when he was seven years old, so this would have been mid-1920s, heavy, um, mm-hmm tuberculosis pandemic at that time. And my grand- grandfather had tuberculosis. So he's in Method, North Carolina. Um, he's the youngest of four children. He is everybody. And if you read stories about Method, you know that a lot of the population was killed because of um, the tuberculosis pandemic. And my grandfather catches um, the disease. And He hears the doctor. So he's sick in the bed and he tells me that he hears the doctor tell his mother, Mama Ida, that he was like, um, the doctor says he's going to die. So just put him out in the back and make him comfortable. And obviously, because I'm here, my grandfather survived. In that process, community was around. And my grandfather, I don't remember because I was young as he's telling me this story. there, There was never kind of this sense of, he was by himself. There was community 
And it was a result of that community that he actually survived catching this um, disease that was killing so many people mm -hmm. within his community. And so, if yeah. your grandfather was there in 1920, then he knew my great grandfather because that's when that oh, community okay. was thriving. My, grand, my great grandfather was still alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure because, like, you said names, and I was like, Yeah, I remember my granddaddy <laughs> saying that person, Beryl Kelly. That's what it was. You said Beryl Kelly, and I was like, I remember that name. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> right. He's the one that brought them all together to found that community. <sighs> yeah, okay. But anyway, our personal stories aside. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but that's like the ancestors. I mean, it, it goes to what we were talking about. Like, so our ancestors kind of just brought us together to have these kind of conversations. Okay, shifting gears to something else. Years ago, you we were talking and we were talking about Indinkra symbols. And you were saying something. I think you were saying something about like that you can chant over the Indinkra symbols to make them to be medicinal for people that don't know Indinkra symbols. They're the symbols you see them everywhere. Actually, I have one on right now. Uh, this one, that's an Indinkra symbol. So you see them yeah, a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you see? Oh, oh, why don't I just hold it up like this? There. So I've got one. <laughs> That I was wearing, oh, but yeah. okay. In Kong, most in Kong, people Kong. think of like Sankofa, that that's like a really popular one, Jinyame. And I always, I knew that they had meanings and I see them stamped on cloth and people put them on jewelry and all kinds of other stuff that go beyond what they were traditionally used for. But you talked about using them as medicine. Can you talk a little bit about that? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you don't have enough time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but no. <laughs> it um so note that everything in nature is used for medicine, can be used for nature. Everything. Mm -hmm. And so what the Akan have done is uh the Dinkara people who the Asante brought into the Akan family many years ago had these symbols and now they are um they were Asante symbols, but now all of the country, especially except for in the far north, use, use these symbols because of what they mean. And just knowing what they mean, it's like in the Akan tradition as in old tradition, your name has a meaning and you're given that name and people call your name so that you can become that, whatever that meaning is, you know or that they recognize that this occurred in your past life. Or as a result of this, these are some things we need to be mindful of. That's in your name. And so if you think of the Adinkra as names, that there are proverbs uh, attached to those names um, in addition to the meaning itself. And so yes, they can be healing. There are different ways they can be healing. Depending on what you're able to do, will depend on the level that you can pull that energy forth. But everybody who um, who uses a, a Dinkra symbol um, can receive the energy from that uh, on some level, if you know what it means. But if you just, well, I'm not going to say that either. I was going to say, if you just adorn it, but even if you just adorn it, it's, it's radiating something for you. So one of the, probably the biggest, it's not an Adinkra symbol, but symbols that are throughout our conscious culture today is the Ankh, you know, the yeah. symbol of light, you know, with uh, with all of the meaning that goes with it is a very restorative uh, symbol. And so even without having to put the medicine to the symbol, it in itself provides a uh, way of being for you. So that I suspect that, you know, when we see people wearing them um, in the community who don't walk according to that, that they're, and then they have all these mishaps, that somehow the energy from that is reminding them that they need to change their ways. And so, yes, be mindful that the Adinkra symbols are powerful symbols. They can be uh, healing just by using them, by calling their names. Uh, and those who do the work um, can use them even deeper. I remember that conversation we had a while ago. 
Wow. Okay, you just blew my mind even further. Wow. Because in my mind, I'm going to all kinds of things. I mean, we can think of Zikra symbols. Like you said, we can think of Ankhs. Uh, in Ifa, we have the Odu and the, the marks of the Odu. So we know that that can be used as medicine. So there are tons of things that as African people that are, are symbolic and we're just thinking, oh, okay. Sometimes people are thinking of it just being symbolic, but you're talking about like that me that meaning radiating an energy that can be useful. That's powerful. Wow. Wow. So I get concerned, you know, I see people coming in, uh, mostly young people, but not all with these tattoos, putting this poison in your skin so you can have a symbol of something that has, you know, made, you know, rose somebody you dated at some point. When you could be wearing, um, or even if you have to use that method, putting something that has powerful meaning from your story, from your history, mm. that yeah. can guide and protect you. And that's what those all of those symbols are intended to do. They each represent an aspect of who we be. And who <laughs> we be is important to who we will be, not just me personally, but for generations to come. And what we have to get back to is realizing that we're not living just for now. We're living for generations to come. And what we do now has an impact. And you can't make that all up in the last five years of your life. You can do some repair, but you've also done some damage to all of those beings around you when you weren't at the Wow. Ashe. Okay. Wow. Okay. We're we're wrapping up. And so again, if you we are here with Dr. Maria Cambone, she is the founder, she's a licensed psychologist. She's also the founder of Onifa psychological and consulting services in the Black Therapy Network. So if you have questions, definitely put those in the chat. Um, uh, Dr. Cambone would love to share your energy. She shared a lot of energy. Even if you don't have questions, share some energy with her because I see y'all are watching and people have been watching steadily. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely just and let Black us know. Black Therapy Central. Oh, I said, I'm sorry. I said Black Therapy Network. Thank you. Black Therapy Central. Tell us a little bit as we get ready to close. Tell us a little bit about Black Therapy Central and how people can get connected with you on well, there. Black Therapy. Right. We like um, we're asking therapists and that and it's a broader base than just mm -hmm. those who do psychological and counseling. We're looking for um, also there's a, a category for natural paths and others who do healing work mm -hmm. to be able to get referrals and have um, um, an audience. You know, you don't have to already be an African center, but your center has to be in our people. You know, um, sure. that's important. You know, and that, of course, you know, we can't limit necessarily your clientele, but it is like a referral source to help and to help us connect and help our people connect. We are overwhelmed with um, people looking for therapists, looking for black therapists. You know? And so we ask you to do that. We have some activities. We've had webinars like this and um, uh, radio programs. We also had a 10 day healing challenge um, so that you can see as we talked about the many different ways to go about healing. Doesn't have to be just talk, you know, uh, psychodynamic approach across from each other, but you heal mm. through music, you heal through dance, you heal through proverbs and their meanings, which we have on that 10 day healing challenge. So we invite you to go back to that. Um, and just, just, come, just come and look. Just come and look at us. And, um, you know, I am so glad that we are connecting as Black people in this family of uh, psychologists, of counselors and all, trying to do this work. So I appreciate you, you so much, um, uh, Sister Ifa, tell you for the work that you're doing. Oh, no, I appreciate you. I appreciate you as being an elder. I mean, being able to look up to you as an elder psychologist, an elder woman psychologist, and just doing this work and being consistent and always just genuinely being kind and happy to see me every time I see you at AB side. I appreciate that, like, because you can really just feel like just your love and your um, amazing energy. If people want to, so two different ways. If it's a, uh, a healer that wants to be able to be connected and um, their services presented on Black Therapy Network, then is there a cost to that? 
No, Black Therapy Central. <laughs> Black Therapy Central! <laughs> BTC. I got it. Okay, I'm not going to forget it now. Black Therapy Central. Okay, is there a cost for them? <laughs> There, there, for, there are two ways. You can just go okay. on and be, um, but mm -hmm. there's a, also a referral, the referral program um, where um, that, there is a cost for that. And so you'll see okay. the different levels depending on what you want to receive there. But if you just want to you know, just be known, um, um, you can just go ahead and put your name up there and you'll say, it'll say free forever. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, there. And then if, if it's someone that is looking for a person of African descent, whether it be a therapist or naturopath or other kinds of healers, then how do they get connected to Black Therapy Central? BTC? They'll go find a therapist. You know, it'll be more difficult. Uh, yeah. There's a section called find a therapist and you go on there and, um, you know, there are those the different levels that'll show up first there in the tiers, depending on, on how much they've engaged Black Therapy Central. And it can go from there. So we're looking for many to come on so that others can find you. And we're hoping that you will see the benefit of being part of Black Therapy Central. It's a collective. Um, and so come on and be a part of us and be a service to our people. Ashay, so I put the link there. It's blacktherapycentral.com. So I have put the link in the chat. You didn't put Black Therapy Network. network right? <laughs> no, I told you once I got BTC that, okay, so this for me in terms of um, how I understand my brain is as soon as I did BTC, it was there. So I had to just do something to, to <laughs> stick it there. But just to do those letters, Same got way. it. <laughs> so I created a new neural pathway for myself because I understand my learning. Hey. And so Ro Rosangela was asking if it is for only for psychology. No. So Dr. Cambone, can you say it again? Um, yes. What kinds of it's, I mentioned is for those who engage in the healing practices. So it's for okay. psychologists, counselors, but it's also for natural paths. You know, you could be a. Um, let me think, you know. Capoeira instructor, you know, okay. as long as you're working toward the building of our community, because our, okay. the community of healing for our people is broad and expansive. And so their people would know what they're looking for. You know, they wouldn't be going necessarily to a chiropractor to look for some issues dealing with um, schizophrenia. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, you would know who you were looking for. And, and then a uh, learning experiences need to go on that some of those, what are called alternative practices, which need to be in the forefront, are there providing uh, ways of healing that our people aren't used to, but are sometimes much more uh, effective than what the, um, the American uh, uh, psychological or the medical field has put out there as the path. So right. you hear so many people talking about doctors and medicine, but you don't hear results of being people being cured from that. Mm. And so we're looking for alternatives that work for our people. Not only not being cured for that, but paying thousands upon thousands of dollars for the rest of their lives to keep it at a level. And usually it's until they die. Right. So that actually, my last question for you, or at least I think is my last question. And, uh, on the Black <laughs> Therapy Central, are there spaces, um, so are you allowing um, a initiated priest to be on there? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. So, you, now, know, so you know, you put your profile in there, if you, okay. depending on the level you come in. If you just put your name, you don't get a profile. That, you know, okay. People just see the name as a chiropractor. But if you put your profile in there, which is requires payment, then they get to read about you to see how you work. So it's like in all of my sites, I put profiles so that people know what they're looking for. You know? mm -hmm. So somebody who's staunch into uh, Western religion may feel a little some way about coming to me. 
Mm-hmm. They don't have to, but they may feel some way, but they know that in advance. So they mm-hmm. may want to try somebody else who doesn't do what I do. Right. But eventually they'll come back. Well, I've noticed that. So like, I, I just kind of stumbled into that. I have my bio up and people come in the office and people said over and over again, oh, I knew what you was about because I looked at your bio. <laughs> so people, so yeah. their ancestors send them and they self-select. And so I haven't, not on one, had experiences where people are like, oh, because they figured out who I was before they show up. Before it, it's there, <laughs> yeah, you know. Do you all have a vetting process for your folks? Um, yeah, we do look at what they send in because we don't want people to present themselves um, as licensed or certified something, and we don't have those things. But we are moving toward um, assisting with those who do want to be certified as African centered. We're involved in that process. So that um, there's a there will be a curriculum attached to becoming one, um, and once that occurs, um, that will go along. But we still look at your your history, your story. You know, mm-hmm. you may not be licensed by American Medical Association, but you might have been trained as a uh, in in our uh, uh, tradition called as uh, Ducini, which is an herbal healer. And so okay. if people can read that, they might see like a naturopathic doctor, et cetera. They deal in healing the body, but not with medicine. And people really do need to go read about that profession and what it's doing to our people rather than for us. Ashe, Ashe. So I'm well, sorry if there are any physicians on the, on the call. It's not really <laughs> meant to attack you because I want you to go look as well. I think that if they if people showed up, the right people have showed up to hear this conversation and people can process whatever information they need to and however their spirit guides them. So Dr. Maria Cambone, it has been a sincere pleasure. I always love talking to you. I always learn so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. And if we ever get out of this COVID, I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Yeah. I told you I'm going to come back up um, to North Carolina because my whole, I have a whole family cemetery there that my girls and I visited last year. So wow. my people are buried there still. Method doesn't exist wow. anymore, but they are buried wow. in that Method cemetery. So yeah, my people are there. Right. Well, there's still Method Road there with a few folks. You know, my my great grandfather's house is still there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. No, I took a sign. I took a picture of the sign that says (laughs) Method because my great great grandparents that were born during enslavement are actually buried in that cemetery. So you got the grave marker. Wow. So definitely come back to Method. Mm. Yeah. Got to go. You know. So from our ancestors to all of your ancestors, realize that the spirit continues. Yes, yes. Okay, so everyone, thank you again for hanging out with us on this Saturday afternoon. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. Connect with us every single week. We are here on Fridays on Facebook Live at 12 o'clock. So I would love to see you again and have a good Saturday. Take care.